Do you made it, Michelle? Miss Joyce, they figured out a way to put music on Zoom. We need to figure that out. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Now I'm just going to do this. And it's 105, Richard. Let's let's go ahead and get started, yeah. All right, oh, you're waiting on me, that's what it was. Okay, so hi guys, uh, I'm Poppy Guthrie, the Executive Director of Indie Design Week, and also our nonprofit that produces Indie Design Week, the Indie Design Collaborative. Um, this is our third year, um, and the first as a nonprofit, so we're really excited to have you here uh, virtually. <laughs> and we wouldn't be able to produce this conference without our sponsors. So our premier sponsors are SEP, a software consulting firm that I work for, Salesforce, and Absorb Productions, which will be presenting all our, our videos um, for the conference. And uh, with that being said, I would love to invite you all to join our online collaborative space. We worked really hard to try to create some interactivity even in this virtual world. So um, I will show you Miro and let me make it a little bit bigger. So this is for all of the homework series. If you're curious about what happened earlier this week, you can zoom out and see all of the activities and notes that were taken. So um, we're taking notes for each speakers. We're embedding the homework and all the articles for your quick access. And then any links that are shared, we try to grab them and include them as well, kind of in context. This is so that we can create a sense of place. And um, if you turn on the cursor right here, you can see the others are here with you <laughs> and you can see their names. So it's not a, a replication of um, being in person, but it's the best we can do in a virtual space. So uh, I invite you to help us take notes. This is not just for our moderators. Um, you can add notes um, as you'd like and um, we posted that link in the chat. So with that, I will pass it back to Richard. Uh well, thanks, Poppy, and thanks so much to Indie Design Weeks, uh, Design Week 2020 for allowing uh, our organization to be involved with this. Uh, I'm Richard McCoy. I'm the Executive Director of Landmark Columbus Foundation, a Columbus, Indiana-based nonprofit. And through a program arm called Columbus Design Institute, we created Homeworks as a kind of response to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as a way to explore different aspects of uh, that that are affecting society and that we feel like design and community come together in a purposeful way um, and potentially to make things better. And so, um, you know, yesterday um, I made a, um, a land acknowledgement um, at the beginning of the session and I'm just going to quickly do that today as well. Um, what's interesting is that um, it actually um, someone tweeted about it after I did it and it was um, fairly popular and it's it's a thing that I don't think many organizations in the United States do very often but I think it's quite common in uh, Canada and particularly in Australia and New Zealand but it's just a simple way to set, to recognize that uh, the land that I'm on and you're on a different land but it was uh, indeed land of another nation um, before that in this case it was the Miami and the Delaware nations that were here before but through the Treaty of St. Mary's in 1818, um, this land was ceded to the United States 
Um, and it's just a way to also recognize uh, that those people uh, still exist today, still have a relationship to this land and just as a way to acknowledge them. Um, I will also put in uh, the link here at some point, um, Indiana University has a really good resources for making land acknowledgements, should you wanna do that with your organization. They have a, a good and simple way to do it. So thanks for letting me do that. Um, thanks for Indie Design Week. Thank you for participating in this, for taking the time out of your living room or wherever you might be to listen to, to this program on food systems. I'm really excited about it. I'm excited to learn a lot about it. Uh, before we do that, I'll just say that we're grateful to the Central Indiana Community Foundation for uh, providing us a grant uh, to do this and we're able to offer this all for free. And um, that uh, we're recording this session and uh, we're also sort of thinking about this session in a way with Rick Valicenti and Courtney Xavier um, to make a summary for tomorrow. So we're gonna summarize four days of work into a 30 minute presentation uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I hope you all will join us for that. And I just, the other comment just to say is that, you know, I think we've, we've really enjoyed the summaries that we've done afterwards and just each time it's been so optimistic and so positive, um, which has been, and particularly today in Indianapolis, uh, a really good thing to be in a place that's filled with optimism. I think as this pandemic goes on, um, these moments of optimism will, uh, are really important for us to, to remember. And so, um, I just am, I'm grateful to be here in an optimistic place. And so in that way today, we're gonna to talk about food systems today and it's, it's a challenging topic. Um, you know, I think we've all seen the food systems uh, be stressed in a way they've never been stressed before. And I, I think we're gonna hear from our speakers today uh, that um, they are set for uh, a continued stress into, uh, into the future. And so uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for folks to be able to, to tell us about their research. And like last time, we're gonna start with some sort of research base and policy based, uh, based thinking around food systems. And then we're gonna transition to organizations that are actively working in this space to change and, and to Im improve it. Um, and so, um, uh, just one other thing, feel free to put comments in the, the chat screen or uh, contact us. We're always happy to have a dialogue. But I'm gonna go ahead and get started and introduce our first speaker, who is Shelly Suttles. Uh, she is an agricultural economist whose work encompasses local and regional food systems, municipal food policy, agricultural energy production, and climate change impact on agricultural land use. Her research applies macroeconomic and microeconomic analysis to a variety of sustainable food system topics. Um, she has a master's of science and a PhD in agricultural economics from Purdue University. Welcome, Shelley. I'm just going to share my screen with everyone, make sure I do it properly. Is that working for everybody? Great. Looks great. Um, so first I just want to start by thanking Richard for inviting me here and Poppy for organizing this. It's great to see you Poppy. Um, and just really it's an honor today to be with the other panelists and you all as participants. You know, I always very much enjoy speaking to the design community because you know, I think outwardly it's kind of two very different fields, food systems versus design, but there's so much opportunity for collaboration. Um, and that's how I really want to close um, the discussion today. Uh, so again, I'm Shelley Suttles. Um, I am an agricultural economist, as Richard mentioned. So um, very briefly again about my background, because um, you know, I think what's most interesting has been the uh, dynamic opportunities I've had to do policy research and policy analysis on food system issues. Um, so I am currently an assistant research scientist at um, Indiana University's Ostrom Workshop. And so within the Ostrom Workshop, there is a transdisciplinary working group called the Sustainable Food System Science Group. And so this is a transdisciplinary team of faculty and researchers across the IU Bloomington campus. So um, faculty and researchers in anthropology, geography, informatics, um, but also public policy and environmental science all coming together to kind of tackle these weighty food system issues. 
So I'm fairly new to the team. I've come on board within the last nine months, um, but I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to integrate um, some of the very interesting sustainable food system projects that exist um, you know, nationally, regionally, and across the globe, but also addressing issues of food insecurity, as well as looking more into kind of what is a hot topic now during COVID around food aggregation and distribution and kind of the center of the supply chain. So prior to coming back to research, I was actually um, with the city of Indianapolis. And so in 2016, an unexpected opportunity came about and that was um, advising the mayor of Indianapolis and the city's office of public health and safety on food policy and programming. And then this all came about because in 2015, a chain of five grocery stores went out of business in central Indianapolis. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with the AA chain of grocery stores. That was kind of the um, impetus for this conversation to be moved into city government. And so the AA grocery stores were, you know, relatively low quality grocery stores, um, but they had significant meaning to the community because they had been there so long. And so when they closed, it was a bit of a shock to the communities that surround those grocery stores. And Mayor Hogsett took the advice of many community members and the Indy Food Council and created that food policy advisor role that exists today. And so the new uh, food policy advisor for the city of Indianapolis is Malala Kennedy. She's wonderful. She's had 13 years of experience working with the city's food and security programs through Indy Parks. Um, so the work continues today and um, an excellent, uh, you know, uh, policy advisor is in that role currently. Um, so when I was in the role, I really felt it was a wonderful opportunity um, to consider ways municipal government can work on food and agriculture as a tool for economic development, but also considering kind of these heavier issues related to food insecurity and limited food access um, that played the city of Indianapolis and Marion County. And these issues are often a symptom of federal, state, and local policies um, that kind of uh, are undergirded by a system, you know, systematic poverty and inequity. So there's kind of multi-layer um, opportunities to tackle these, not necessarily solely through food policy. And so prior to working for the city of Indianapolis, I was actually a research economist at the United States Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service in Washington, DC. So I spent about seven years in research that focused, um, as Richard mentioned, on kind of prominent food system uh, research. So doing microeconomic analysis of local and regional food systems, but also kind of global trade analysis of agricultural energy use as well as agricultural land use. And so um, kind of where my research background kind of comes and creates a nexus of many of these other issues is that I've always been interested in how non-food policies actually impact the food system. So it's very important to think about that um, energy policy, environmental policy, economic policy, all do have an impact on um, how the food system has come about. So when we think about what exactly is the food system, so Richard asked me to discuss um, food system challenges, but first I wanted to make sure we're all kind of discussing the same, using the same language in the discussion. And so what I think about, um, you know, what is the food system? What are the components of the food system? So I would say the food system is actually a system of various subsystems. So we can think about the food system not only being that biological, environmental, or agricultural system, but also includes economic subsystems, political subsystems, social subsystems, and obviously, you know, health subsystems as we think about the conversation around healthy eating and improved nutrition. Um, so all of these subsystems are working in tandem to create the food system that we have today. But additionally, we can talk about um, the food system another way and kind of for economists, we would kind of think about the food supply chain and food industries. So when we think about the interactions amongst the food supply chain, we know that there's commerce throughout the system. So there's agricultural and livestock production, there's global fisheries, there's food processing, food manufacturing, food retail, or what you know colloquially we would say as grocery stores or online grocery delivery. And we also have food service and food services restaurants, it's school cafeterias, hospital cafeterias, anybody that's um, typically serving a hot meal. 
And so all of this commerce is happening with customers and other suppliers throughout the system. And this is happening at many different levels of geography. So when we think about um, a global supply chain for food, um, definitely some big brands come to mind. So when we think about European brands like Nestle and Dannon, we can think about big US brands, you know, McDonald's, the US embassy for anybody who's ever been overseas. Um, you know, Goya is actually a very large US brand. It's the largest Hispanic owned business in the United States. So if you see canned beans or um, different seasonings, Goya is a very large uh, food business um, based in the United States. There's also big um, South and Central American brands like Bimbo um, as Baker. We know that recently um, the WH group out of China um, purchased Smithfield um, meat processing, which has kind of um, come to the forefront in that conversation um, about global uh, mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, one of my favorite African brands is a restaurant chain called Nando's. You know, if you're a DC resident, that is a go-to um, to pick up that delicious chicken. So, you know, there's a very wide um, global network and global commerce and food, and it's all, you know, starting from agricultural production, ending all the way to food service. So similarly, we have national markets and national brands, as well as having regional and local markets and regional and local brands. So local farmers market, local restaurants that typically only exist in your city. Um, so there's a lot of um, commerce throughout that um, local, regional, national, and global system. And so in addition to kind of having these different markets, there's interactions between these different markets. Um, so raw agricultural inputs are purchased by processing firms. Processed wholesale goods are purchased um, by uh, retail wholesalers. Those packaged goods are brought to market um, through retail grocery store, online delivery, and then consumers are purchasing food through food service. So, so there's a lot of interaction even amongst those businesses and not necessarily always outward facing to the public. So it's important to think about what happens beyond behind the scenes and not necessarily what we see at the grocery store or restaurant. So when we think about, um, you know, kind of policy related to food systems, particularly in the context of the COVID outbreak, um, unfortunately, we're still kind of tackling those issues as researchers. Um, data is not coming out as quickly because it is typically not collected in, um, you know, this type of format. So for us getting monthly data this soon hasn't happened yet. Um, so just to know that the Discussions are incredibly new and they're incredibly complex and researchers all across the country, all across the world are um, looking to kind of give answers, but it's something we're still working on. So for me right now, if I think about some concerns or some research questions we might have um, as food system researchers, I would say, you know, more attention needs to be paid around subsidizing businesses that are failing, you know, generally all businesses, but perhaps even food businesses, of course, and is this the best use of government funds? So if we think about um, what our ultimate goal with the subsidy is, it's ultimately to meet individuals and residents' basic needs. And so are we doing that by funding businesses? Or are we doing that by subsidizing households? And that's something that needs greater attention um, in the near term. But also when we think about the food system explicitly and the food supply chain, um, given the outbreak, it's definitely important to think about the future of the labor supply. So this will have significant impacts to the food systems labor supply, and it's important that we understand these lessons now um, in order to correct them in the future. So um, you know, see these are kind of very weighty issues, and so these are typically why I've taken the positions that I've taken um, in my career, um, looking to figure out how we can answer some of these questions or help residents and local communities deal with some of these policy issues. And so kind of at the local level, there's two kind of major issues that we're seeing play out right now with the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And these issues unfortunately existed prior to the outbreak and their food security or food insecurity and food access. So I can go into more about these um, quickly for you all. So we, if we start with food insecurity, we know that the USDA and various um, global agencies have defined what food insecurity is. So we would say a household is experiencing low food security if they're reporting reduced quality, variety, or desirability in the diet that they're consuming. 
but at that point there's little or no indication of reduced food intake so they're not eating less but in the category of very low food security these are where households are indicating multiple um, disruptions in their eating patterns so quality variety and desirability of that diet but in addition to that they're also reporting reduced food intake so they are eating less than they normally would because they cannot financially afford to do so and we see that play out more and more given the uh, pandemic so prior to the pandemic i just want to give you guys some statistics that existed um, on food insecurity so globally um, according to to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, or the FAO, um, about 820 million people across the globe were food insecure as of 2019. And so that's going to be exacerbated um, by COVID-19. So according to Feeding America, when we think about the United States, what's happening with food insecurity, in 2017, their map, the meal gap um, by Feeding America showed that 12.5% of Americans were food insecure in the United States. Um, at the same time, 13.3% of Hoosiers were food insecure and 17.4% of Marion County residents were food insecure. So we can see in our region as the geography gets smaller and zooms in on us, food insecurity is actually getting worse. So Marion County and the city of Indianapolis actually have higher food insecurity rates um, than the average in the state of Indiana or the average over the United States. So when we think about policy solutions for food insecurity, so unfortunately because this issue did very much exist prior to the COVID-19, um, a variety of different policy solutions have already been created at the global, um, national, and local levels. So we know that the FAO and the U.S. Um, Agency on International Development have existing international efforts to tackle food insecurity. At the national level, we have the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Farm Bill assisting um, U.S. residents with their food insecurity needs. At the state level, um, that those federal programs um, filter through the state's Family and Social Services Administration so that um, residents are able to take advantage of those federal food assistance programs. And at the local level, we have the city, county, and a variety of different um, nonprofit organizations, charitable organizations, religious groups, working to tackle food insecurity in the city of Indianapolis and Marion County. And that's the same for most communities um, in the United States. So in the US, um, if we wanna kind of dive a little bit deeper into kind of what is available for emergency food assistance and um, nutrition assistance, it's kind of a bit of an alphabet soup um, so there's the National School Lunch Program, the NSL, there's CACFP, there's SNAP, there's WIC, there's TFAP, there's TANF. Um, there's a variety of different programs that help residents get these food and nutrition assistance that, um, resources that they need. And so um, because many um, remedies existed prior to COVID-19, um, we would say that this is going to be a persistent issue and even after COVID-19. It's very important to see what's happening at the national level. Um, so when the um, White House has decided to cut funding for, for um, United Nations and World Health Organization, or the WHO, um, over the dispute over the origins of COVID, um, we ultimately know this will negatively impact the existing work the WHO was doing on food insecurity and famine programs across the globe. Um, so it's important that we advocate for these programs to continue um, because the WHO and various U.S., excuse me, U.N. agencies were working on food insecurity programs. So when we think about the second issue that's kind of come to light um, for the average resident, um, given the COVID-19 pandemic, we also see that food access um, is the second issue. And so food access was actually first discussed um, in depth in the United Kingdom in the 1990s. And this is when the UK press coined the term food desert um, in regards to the limited food access that was being witnessed across the United Kingdom. And so limited food access is actually a different phenomenon than food insecurity, um, but unfortunately it's often confused and conflated with food insecurity because they're both um, food issues, food policy issues, food system issues. So most simply, food access differs from food insecurity 
And that food access is really an issue of proximity or access to retail groceries. Um, and not often has a financial component. So when we think about how the federal government in the United States define food access, uh, we know that they kind of look at three general ways we, one could um, define food access. And the first is accessibility, obviously. So what are the opportunities and sources for healthy food in a community? And so this can be measured by distance to a retail grocery store, which it often is. It can be measured by the number of stores in a community. Um, so I don't know if all of you kind of follow this issue, but in 2014, um, Redfin reported that Indianapolis um, tied for the worst food desert in the United States. Um, but it's important to understand how Redfin was defining that. And they were using a distant measure that said um, they were looking at neighborhoods that um, did not have a grocery store within a five minute walk. And we know that due to the unified government of city of Indianapolis and Marion County, um, some of the outlying regions are much more suburban. So it is um, difficult for many communities um, to be within that five minute walk according to Redfin's um, measure of accessibility. But accessibility can also include individual level resources and neighborhood level resources. On the individual level, we can look at a household's income or whether or not that household has access to a private vehicle. On the neighborhood level, we can understand more about the average income or the median household income in that neighborhood, or we can see if that neighborhood has availability to public transportation, such as bus or rail. And so I really like to tell people it's important that limited food access is not considered um, a symptom of underproduction of food. Um, something we're seeing right now with the COVID-19 outbreak is that obviously the United States produces a ton of food. And prior to this outbreak, we actually produced a tremendous amount of food that was considered overproduction that was creating considerable amount of food waste. Um, we were you know, dumping food on the global market. We were um, wasting food prior to the outbreak. So what you see on TV today is nothing new. The US had always, um, you know, within the last 50 years overproduced food. Um, so when we think about globally, you know, the United States and Europe, um, the European Union, uh, are producing too much food. They're producing more food than anybody on the planet can eat, even outside of the US and Europe. So really limited food access is not an issue of underproduction of food. It's a market inefficiency um, where the supply chain is inadequate to get food from the producers to the consumers. And so this is really important that we look at better distribution systems. And that, you know, there's not, I would say a one size fit all um, distribution system, different communities, rural versus urban, um, you know, low density versus high density may have different systems, but it's important that we think about tailoring these food distribution systems to meet the community. And so we know that in the United States, um, there are some um, opportunities for policy solutions. And so we can see now that the, there is greater importance for diversified supply chains. Um, so it's important for us to realize that the next then the next, well, excuse me, the next disruption to the food system might not play out necessarily play out like the COVID-19 outbreak. So it may more directly impact the food system from the very beginning. So, you know, I would say we've had two months to kind of come to this conclusion around some of the um, unfortunate issues that are happening with agriculture. Um, but the next disruption to the food system may be very direct impact. You know, it could be a food board illness, a food related pathogen that immediately impacts the food system. So it's important we think about the variety of options, the diversification in the supply chain so that we can overcome um, the next issue we may have. Um, but I would also say in terms of policy solutions, it's important that we keep an eye towards um, future technological innovation in this area, particularly around retail food access, grocery, online delivery, um, and right now we see that it's really important that we make online delivery equitable. And so ways to make online delivery more equitable um, could include, you know, subsidizing internet coverage for low income residents. Um, most importantly, allowing people who get these federal um, nutrition assistance benefits to be able to use their benefits for online purchases 
which they are not allowed to do so nationally right now. Although USDA is piloting a program with Amazon to be able to um, do some of these online purchases at all retailers eventually across the country. Um, but it's also important that we think about physical um, infrastructure being um, appropriate for these deliveries. So does the infrastructure exist to support safe and secure deliveries? You know, we've had residents say that they are very interested um, in food delivery as an option, um, but you know, maybe their porch isn't covered to shade the product, um, which can create food safety issues, or maybe they just feel that um, the package wouldn't be there when they got home from work. So is there an opportunity um, for libraries or other public spaces that are open later to um, be able to house these products while folks wait to pick them up? And so there's a variety of different local food businesses and community projects, community food projects that already exist in the neighborhood, um, especially around Indianapolis. And so I wouldn't say that, you know, obviously there's a one size fits all solution, um, but these projects can be very complementary to the diversification of a food system. So I think we need to ask ourselves, how do we support these community food projects and local food businesses and to help them incorporate into conventional markets? So whether that's assisting them with food safety certification so they can um, integrate themselves in these conventional markets, but also setting them up to make sure that they are able to um, be involved in this kind of online space for online delivery. Because we know that many of these local food businesses are a great tool for food literacy and food education. So I would really just kind of ask you all kind of my call to action for the design community. Um, number one would be to patronize your favorite food businesses and community food projects. Um, that exists around the city of Indianapolis or your communities, wherever you may be, it's important that we show support right now. Um, but for all of you as design professionals, I would say it's an opportunity to be forward thinking about creative solutions to the, evol the evolution of these food policy issues that we have. Um, so whether it's food access, food security, kind of food entrepreneurship within these food industries, I think design professionals really can offer something um, very beneficial to moving these projects and business ideas forward. So with that, um, I thank you all. I didn't know how Richard would like to proceed. Yeah. Thanks, Shelley. That was really great. You covered um, a ton of information. I don't exactly know how you had all of that um, right off the top of your head. That's uh, really, that was really amazing. Thank you for such a, uh, an excellent talk. I'm going to do what I do is uh, the clap and thank you for, there's my little uh, I can make a clap emoji by my face. So thanks for such a great presentation. Um, very thoughtful and I love um, all of the detail. I took lots of notes, um, but your call to action was really great. One is, you know, I think we've heard this a little bit before is to patronize the places that you value in your community that are providing a, a, a food system. And then the second one is really to ask designers to think about this from a systems level and to think about it from a policy level situation. And I really appreciate those. We'll put those in the notes and make sure um, that we get that out to folks. And I think actually we're gonna, we're gonna hear a little bit of that sort of innovation as we go through today. And so thanks again for framing out um, really the, the big think and the data and you know, uh, a way to understand uh, the complexity of the problem. Thank you. Well, so we are going to move now um, up to Muncie uh, to hear from uh, Josh Groover, uh, who, who's a professor at Ball State University and his research is focused on the human dimension of natural resource management. Uh, he is interested in the socio-cultural, economic, and biophysical dimensions that help shape our relationship with natural resources and how we manage them. Um, his current work is with small scale farmers in East Central Indiana and helping to foster a sustainable regional food system. He is the director of the Muncie Food Hub Partnership, whose mission is to nourish and strengthen the, the Muncie community through the robust exchange of fresh and affordable local food. Thanks, Josh. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, I guess let me uh, share my screen here just to get that uh, part ready. Right. Can everybody see what we have here? Okay, awesome. 
Uh, well, thank you very much, Richard, for this opportunity and all of you who are helping to put together Indie Design Week. And uh, it's, just, it's just a great opportunity to uh, be in front of you all from my dining room. So uh, I appreciate that. Um, Shelley, thanks for your really informative talk. Um, I think it pairs really well with some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, I liked how you, you know, really sort of this broad um, um, food insecurity and economics and policy broad issues looking at that national perspective um, like richard said i'm i'm gonna take it to more of a regional perspective um, and look at some of the things uh, that we've been doing here in muncie and in east central indiana uh, toward um, developing a more sustainable food system a food system that works for more people than it has been um, in the past um, and so I guess I'd start the same way Shelley did, telling you a little bit about myself. Um, I actually didn't learn about food systems or farming or anything in my um, education. Uh, I was trained as a, a forester, uh, so to speak. I, I studied people who own forests, so um, a sort of a, a, a sociologist in that respect. And I got my training at Penn State University. Um, and then came here as my first job out of my PhD program to Ball State. And my hope was to do some of the same work um, that I was doing in Pennsylvania here in East Central Indiana. And I don't know if any of you have been to East Central Indiana before, um, but there are no trees. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, that limited um, uh, that kind of work. And actually there, there would still be uh, that kind of research to do here, but I got really interested in uh, talking to farmers and agriculture here. And uh, for those of you who have never been to ECI, which uh, I'm sure most of you have, um, you know, it's very flat. And as far as the eye can see, we're looking at corn and beans for the most part. Uh, so commodity crops, these are crops that are uh, bought and sold and traded um, at the national level. Um, and uh, so I became really interested in people who were doing something different in East Central Indiana, not the traditional corn and beans, but were actually growing food that we could, that we can eat without uh, processing it anymore. So broccoli and lettuce and honey and chicken, et cetera. Um, so that led me down this whole rabbit hole or path, I maybe is a better way to put it, um, into thinking about agriculture, sustainable ag, and food systems. Um, and one of the first things, I guess, that struck me was thinking about um, where our food comes from. Um, and this is, a, this is a map, it's a county level map, but it shows broadly uh, where much of our crops in the, in the United States, uh, where their sources are. Um, the coloring is a little wonky. You can see the, the Midwest there. So Iowa, Illinois, Indiana um, is like a sort of like a purplish red. And it's a combination, I think, of the uh, orange for corn and the red, dark red for soybean. Um, you can see areas where there's wheat and where hay and silage is mostly coming from. And then you look at the fruits, nuts and vegetables. Um, so the produce uh, and things that keep us healthy. And much of that comes from the Central Valley in California, so far, far away. Um, and also you see some of that too in the uh, American Southeast uh, and along the Mississippi Valley there. Um, but that just is a, an astounding view of where our food is coming from. And what makes this, I think, interesting to me in learning about Indiana is uh, presumably 90% of what we eat here is actually imported into the state, even though we are actually, at least in East Central Indiana, we're, you know, our family traditions go way back in terms of farming and working the land to provide food. Um, but the way our system is set up, it is set up as such where we have, um, where we're growing food in, in places that maybe we shouldn't be. If you've been out to the Central Valley in California, you know, they get uh, six to seven inches of rain a year. Um, whereas here in Indiana, our average is about 40 inches of rain a year. Uh, we get a lot of good sun days. Uh, so we're actually in a prime spot for growing, uh, growing things. And we're really good at it. Um, 
So I think it's interesting to also uh, see what our current food system looks like. And there are all sorts of images that we could, that we could look at. And, and I'm sure that you've seen many of them yourself. Um, this is a photograph by uh, George Steinmetz that appeared in the New York Magazine. Oh, it's probably been a year or two ago. But he was able to take a lot of pictures of what our current national global food system looks like. Um, and this picture, oh, it just astounds me. Uh, this is a lettuce uh, processing plant. Um, it's Taylor Farms. Um, they um, purchase, they don't grow their own lettuce, but they purchase from many different farmers. And they grow something like 14 million pounds a week. I'm sorry, they process it. Um, and so that, that pretty much is one in three Americans um, uh, get their lettuce. And this is the lettuce you'll find in those plastic uh, tubs, you know, at the grocery store. Um, the other unique thing about this situation is that this whole operation is movable. So as the lettuce season um, uh, moves from Southern California into Arizona, this whole operation picks up and moves with it. Um, so we're looking at, you know, 1,400 tons of machinery, uh, lots of employees moving from Salinas, California into Yuma, Arizona in a given season, and then they do it all again. Pretty astounding. Um, so I got interested in this because, wow, there were people here in East Central Indiana uh, who were starting to grow things other than corn and beans. There was more of an interest in local food and, and food sustainability and sustainable agriculture here when I first, when I first arrived. Um, many of our farms in East Central Indiana, uh, you sort of see a hollowing out of, in terms of size, right? You see a lot of farms getting bigger, so um, accumulating land um, to grow more corn and beans, or uh, they tend to be broken up and to, and to get uh, smaller. And so some of those smaller farms, uh, many people were trying to make a go of growing different kinds of food and trying to figure out uh, where to sell it. Um, and that's what interested me, the small scale ag. Um, here you're looking at a bar chart that's showing um, acreage classes, um, farms, and number of farms, excuse me, along your y-axis there. And this is just in Indiana. And you can see over, the period of years from 1997 to 2012, I mean, just by looking at that 10 to 49 acre category, you can see the number of farms increasing there. And you also see the really big farms, like over on the right there, the 2000 plus acre farms, those are also getting a lot bigger. And then the medium sized farms kind of, you know, it's hollowing out. Those are getting smaller over time. Um, so this really led me to uh, go talk to small scale farmers who were trying to grow food that we can eat in this area. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting. It's there, there, uh, there are these little islands of produce in these vast um, oceans of corn and bean. Um, and so there are a lot of issues there that, that we won't get into today, but thinking about, um, pesticide spray and and those sorts of things that impact small scale farmers but these these folks really are, are trying to make a go of it and we were really interested to learn how it's going um, we also were interested in their soil and their perceptions of soil quality and how they were uh, mitigating those things um, and I um, instead of collecting soil samples I interviewed um, a lot of these farmers and learned a lot about um, about what motivates them. You know, this stuff isn't uh, rocket science, but, but just learning things for me, it was really helpful to understand that, um, that most of them are very passionate about what they do. Uh, they, are, um, they look at themselves as feeding their community. Um, they look at themselves as environmental stewards. Um, they're concerned about their family's health. In fact, many of them went into farming to actually produce better foods for their family. Um, and then are expanding from there. Um, so a lot of passion there, um, but it's a really hard row to hoe um, because our area, um, uh, there, there's not a huge, um, I would say market for, uh, for broccoli, um, especially locally grown broccoli. We heard a lot about obstacles to their businesses as well. So I was really interested to learn, you know, what, 
what stood in the way of, of the things that they do and, and are they trying to grow their business and how do they see themselves in the future and that sort of thing. Um, lots of obstacles. I think the, the ones that really stuck out to me were things like um, basically needing more places to sell the stuff they're growing. Uh, many times farmers, you know, you can store corn and beans in a silo and they can, you know, wait for months on end um, and they're still going to be the same. They'll still be ready to use but you can't do that with Brussels sprouts. Um, and so once they grow this food, they need places to sell it. And that's uh, where they really struggled, particularly here in East Central Indiana, um, where Walmart really is the best place to go to, to buy produce. Um, so many of them were taking uh, what they were growing and feeding it to their chickens or their hogs, or um, in some cases, some of them were able to give it away um, and so that, that was really disheartening. The other thing to learn that, that I learned is that um, the sources that, you know, for them to learn about how they were doing what they were doing, they, they just they had to go to different states to learn, for example, how to grow apples. Um, you know, um, Purdue Extension at that point, um, they, farmers felt like that, that, that there wasn't enough um, uh, resources or um, educational opportunities to, to um, really inform them how to do uh, what they wanted to do. So these kinds of things really impacted me. And um, at the same time, as I was learning more about farmers, trying to figure out how I could, you know, how I could help them find different markets. I was also learning about food insecurity and Shelley you know, uh, described what that, what that means. Um, and for me, I was learning it all new, but um, we have some really um, high food insecurity levels here in Delaware County and in East Central Indiana in general. Um, many of uh, car manufacturing plants um, had, you know, basically um, um, uh, closed their shop doors, some of them as late as um, I think 2008 or 2007 was the big Borg Warner plant here that closed. So really high poverty rates at this time in, you know, it was 2014 that I was doing some of this research. Um, uh, unemployment rates in the county were really high, somewhere around 10%. Now they're much lower than that. But we still have issues with food insecurity, um, somewhere around 20% or so for our residents um, and children here in Delaware County. Uh, so um, essentially I was funded to, um, you know, the story was how can we link farmers out in the county and the county surrounding, uh, surrounding Muncie, uh, how can we link the food that they're growing to people who, um, who need food and particularly healthy foods. Um, so we started mapping uh, grocery stores and started talking to a lot of people about how best to do this. And this was just a simple map of all of the um, all of the store, any, any store selling food in Muncie. Um, and the green dots are, are where they're selling, uh, you know, there might be some produce, whether it's maybe a, a basket of apples, um, like at a Dollar General or a gas station. And the black dots are more like gas stations, um, like Hoosier Pete's and things like that. But already just seeing where food is, you could start to see uh, some holes, um, in certain areas, you know, I'm looking in the north uh, east corner here, and out in in the in the kind of the corners of the city, and then in the internal parts of the city. Some of these green dots are like organic shops and things like that, where people can't tend to our population tends to not be able to afford things like that. Um, so looking um, at food insecurity in general, now I'm really focusing in on Muncie here. We can see um, those areas. Um, you know, taking some of the criteria that Shelley was talking about, so proximity to a store, uh, um, income in that particular neighborhood, whether they're above or below the poverty line, and whether they have access to a car, um, and we began to understand what these food desert um, areas look like, um, and begin communicating this to people. Um, some of the other mapping work that we did, and, and, and I feel like it really shows um, where some of the problem areas are. Here you're looking at um, percent residents with no car, that's the blue. And so the darker blue uh, neighborhoods are where, uh, where 45 to 51% of people don't have a car or access. 
to a car. And then you're looking at the non-green stippled areas there uh, as being, you know, quote unquote, food deserts. And those brown squares are uh, lower income apartment complexes. So where a lot of people live without a lot of money and without a lot of access. Um, so we are using these tools to begin communicating to people where we see problem areas and to start conversations about how we, um, how we proceed, um, knowing that this is a problem. And so, well, it, it might be easy to say, well, well, can't people just hop on the bus? And, and that has its own problems as well. Here's a map of our bus system and you can see it's like, um, like spokes from a wheel. Um, you can't, for example, if you uh, want to get from this neighborhood here um, to the Walmart um, over here, uh, you have to go into the exchange in the middle of town, catch another bus to the Walmart, and then go back. So you're looking at, at over half the day riding the bus, getting your groceries, um, if that's what you want to do. Um, so it, it's not necessarily conducive um, to uh, bringing food back home. For folks. So, at, you know, all while this is happening, I'm kind of putting all of this together. There were a couple of feasibility studies um, done. One was done by Purdue, and that's this one here. Um, and another one was done by the Indiana State Department of Agriculture on um, whether we could locate a food hub in central Indiana or in east central Indiana. And I'm not sure if people are familiar with the concept of a food hub. And so I'll, here's a schematic kind of showing uh, what this is. It's, it's essentially a, a business that helps distribute um, food products um, at, a, at a regional level. Um, and so you're, you are purchasing dairy and meat, fruits and vegetables, all sorts of things that's coming into the food hub from many different farmers. You're aggregating those products and then selling those products. Um, the idea is to sell it um, at a scale where uh, schools and hospitals can actually take advantage um, of this. So even small scale farmers could be part of a food hub, sell their you know, 10 pounds of tomatoes um, that, that won't necessarily run Ball State's cafeterias, but if you add their 10 pounds of tomatoes to, you know, th uh, 30 other farmers growing 10 pounds of tomatoes, well, then you might have enough to sustain uh, a larger institution. Um, the, what happens with a food hub, the idea is that eventually people will see that this is a really good thing. And, and it, the idea is that it might grow more farmers and more people to supply a local or a regional um, system. So um, you start seeing these food hubs pop up all over the country. Um, I think at least a year ago was the last time I checked, there were something like 200 food hubs popping up uh, nationally. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is interested in um, funding food hubs and seeing how this more uh, regionalized food distribution system works. Um, and so, uh, so that's where our minds went. My team and I started thinking, well, maybe we could do something like that here. Um, and so we did, we spent a year essentially taking our maps um, and, and having conversations with neighborhoods and how, what is a, what might a food hub look like here? Is that something we wanna do? How would this work? Um, and we, we put together this food security assessment. And um, what we heard from our community was that maybe it's not a full scale food hub because we have a lot of farmers here, but there are a lot of really small scale farmers. Um, so we started with a smaller version of a food hub and we made it mobile. Um, and so um, much of my work the past three years or so has been trying to make this what we call the Muncie Food Hub Partnership work. And it is essentially a pop-up farmer's market. Um, we uh, tend to go to neighborhoods that, um, that invite us in and, and want access to uh, fresh produce. We, um, we purchase products from multiple farmers. And so to me, it kind of fits that food hub model where we're trying to help farmers by purchasing more of their products and then selling them at, at a low cost, uh, as low as we can. Um, in, in various neighborhoods around Muncie. 
So that, that's essentially what we're doing. I've had a lot of help from um, students. So I'm teaching classes and incorporating this sort of um, service learning, immersive learning style of, of education here at Ball State. Um, and so they've helped us, um, my students have helped us, you know, come up with a mission statement and all of the, uh, you know, maps and information to, to kind of market ourselves. Um, they help man the, the, the truck and the trailer that we have. Um, we also have a student farm. Um, and ideally, we're not, we're not doing this yet, but the idea is that we would students would be involved in growing food there and that food would go um, out and be distributed by this uh, um, mobile farmers market. This is a picture of our farm. It just looks better. It's a rendering. It's not an actual picture. It just looks so much better than the real picture. <laughs> Actually, I think I, oh, here's a, here's a real picture of the barn and uh, that's a shipping container there. And what we've done is we converted that into a big refrigerator. It's, it was an old refrigerated shipping container that no longer worked. Um, and there's, you know, Shelly talked about technology and helping us um, um, think about ways to better distribute food. Uh, well, there's some pretty simple technologies where even on a farm, a farmer can, can do this, can outfit a, a part of their barn, for example, into a cooler space. And that's one of the things that's really hard to do is hard to keep your food fresh um, before you sell it. And this is one way where you can keep it fresh for at least a week or more. Um, so we have farmers drop food off here at our cooler and then days um, during the week, Monday through Friday, we're taking that to various locations. This has been running, this, we're going into our third year now. Um, and you can see this is a map of pretty much downtown Muncie and our locations. And we move around throughout the day. Um, we stay consistent about where we are. Um, and so people can, can expect us, you know, at Thursday at 1130, we're gonna be at the Whiteley uh, Community Pantry. Um, and, and, that's, and that's how we've maintained and built up some, some of our customer base. Um, just some gratuitous pictures of students here who have been really um, instrumental in helping put this thing together. I mean, it's taken, you know, several years. Um, uh, some more pictures here. This is our trailer that we got. It's an air conditioned trailer. This is what we use to move the food around. Um, that's just a picture in the back there toward uh, the fall season last year. Um, you can see um, um, some of the design actually since since I'm talking to designers we've had a lot of help from some of uh, some of our uh, awesome Ball State architect students and faculty um, like Jana Shimizu I think is on this call Pam Harwood and Kevin Klinger the wood in there in the trailer has is reclaimed wood from um, uh, trees that they knocked down to build a, a dorm here. And so we've been able to incorporate some really nice features um, into what we're doing. They helped us build stands, really nice um, display racks and things like that for our, um, for our market. Um, you know, one of the questions you may have is thinking about, um, well, how to, you know, I mean, when I think of a farmer's market, I think of paying, you know, $5 a pound for beets. Um, so how do you keep um, prices uh, down um, for people of, of, lo of low income? And so we do take advantage of things like women, infant and children, uh, vouchers, um, SNAP, senior farmers market uh, checks. We have a deal with IU Health. We get IU Health bucks um, from them. So they're um, beginning to help us, um, help us basically keep our prices down. Um, and that's how we're able to do it. So we're most, our prices are kept at grocery store level prices uh, or lower. In some cases it might be a little bit higher, but. Um, um, and I'll just end, cause I know I'm probably going long here, but um, I think some of the spinoffs of this have been, uh, have been really important. And I think speak to where this is heading, uh, at least in our region. One of the things we did is, you know, um, wanted to report back essentially our, you know, our year of listening and data collection that we, we did. And um, 
So we fashioned what we called a local food summit to kind of report back, well, this is what we've heard from our community about how we can help connect food to people in need. Um, and it turned into an annual thing. I, I thought we'd have one year, but there was a lot of interest. So we're on our coming into our fifth year of what we call the local food summit. And, and essentially this is a one day conference. Uh, we invite speakers in, we have uh, working groups, um, similar to Indie Design Week, I think, but, um, but condensed into a day for right now. And participants are all over the gamut, chefs and farmers and um, all the food is locally sourced. Um, and we have conversations about the, this past year and kind of and what we're doing in the future. And there's a lot of interest in starting to combine um, our food summit with, um, for example, Madison County just started having these um, as well. Um, and so we're starting to look at regional food summits um, here probably next year or the year after. Uh, the other spinoff of this work uh, was, a, was a food council and we're calling it the Delaware County Food Council. This is um, essentially a group of citizens and residents and uh, people who are interested in um, um, creating policy that helps us um, distribute food and grow food in, in, a, in a way that, that helps people. Uh, so this past year, um, we, you know, we've had just a great membership from uh, Open Door Health Services, pantry organizers, soup kitchen managers, citizens, farmers, etc. Our advisory group is made up of uh, people from Ball State, uh, Indiana University, uh, with IU Health. We have IU Health here, a hospital here, and Purdue. Um, and so our two efforts right now that we're uh, working with are food recovery. So what happens to food that isn't eaten? at restaurants, how can we connect that to people in need and also thinking about farm to school in our region. Um, and so I guess I would add on, um, um, you know, these efforts plus multiple other things are beginning to happen in our community. It's like the conversation is really kind of crescendoing here in East Central Indiana, I feel like community gardens, um, some really interesting design work. That picture is a model of, um, of some of the design work that Pam Harwood was doing at, um, for a community garden at a local library. And that's one of our places where we stop. And, and it's just now a beautiful area with uh, shelter and, and uh, stalls where um, community producers can sell their, uh, their goods. We have community food boxes around town now. Um, and I think, you know, as we, this COVID um, situation, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at um, is uh, connecting uh, some of the foundations that we have in East Central Indiana. So we're lucky to have the, you know, the Ball brothers uh, here and there were five brothers and I think all of them have their own foundation. So we're beginning to connect them to um, some of the pantries and soup kitchens here who are in need of uh, being able to essentially purchase food to give it away for free. Um, so we've had some meetings um, on, on how best to do that and they have been really, really valuable. Um, some of the other work that we're doing, I'm hoping to take advantage of um, some of the funding from these foundations here in the season and uh, basically be able to purchase more food from local farmers and to provide that for um, soup kitchens. So um, um, I think the, the local, the, sorry, the um, mobile farmers market can play a role in that distribution system. Um, but, you know, I'll end here uh, and just wanting to say that I think um, part of where we need to go is really building up this kind of infrastructure. It's not necessarily um, the physical infrastructure, but some of that social infrastructure that, that needs to be present um, in order to make some of these connections, in order to get food that might go to waste to people who need it. It's a really simple thing to do, but it takes our attention and it takes um, make, being someone to actually make that connection. Um, and so that's what I'm starting to see here in, in Muncie and in East Central Indiana in general. And um, I thank you for listening. I hope I didn't uh, go too crazy long. No, that was great, Josh. Thanks very much. I'm going to uh, 
clap in in <laughs> so thanks so much for a really informative and interesting uh take on it and what a great journey from uh being a interested in forestry and <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in the Northeast Indiana, that's it. That's it. it um, but it, there's first of all, there was a really active uh, chat comment. I think we could have a lot of discussions. But uh, um, I'm, if maybe if you could look at some of those during the next bit and maybe respond to a few of those questions, and I ask you to do that. But I'd sure. like to keep moving. But I want to just maybe if I could sum up like sort of all of the questions with one question, which is to say. How will you know this is working? What outcome will you have produced? And is there a way to measure that? Do you guys go back and study it? But like, what's the, how do you, how do you know that it's working? Obviously it is. Janice, one of your colleagues was commenting just from a, a personal and emotional level, it was a great experience, but how do you know you're making an impact? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm uh, right now trying to figure out a way to actually measure that. Um, but I think the thing that, um, sticks out to me is when somebody comes up to our mobile market and says, I really depend on you guys being here each week. Um, and so that, that is beginning to happen. Um, and I think, you know, on, on a broader level, uh, looking at our, at our food summits and, and sort of the, the, the pouring out of, the, you know, again, I expected that just to be one year and it has now been something that I can't stop. I'd actually like to step away because <laughs> it takes a lot of time. So I want somebody else to help. Um, but um, but that but the fact that that keeps steamrolling and keeps getting bigger, uh, we're being asked to be in too many places actually. So I have to really kind of focus because I can only do so much and my students can only do so much. Um, so we have to say no sometimes to being um, um, in in too many at too many different host sites. It sounds like we need more uh, forest majors from Pennsylvania to move yeah. to, to North right. Indiana. <laughs> uh, no, but it's but uh, okay. Well, I, I it's you have a lot of great questions. I've asked you maybe just to look at those, but I, I just want to be mindful of time and move on to our next presenter. And so, thanks so much, Josh, for that presentation, and Shelley for sort of framing out some some bigger concepts. And now it's moving to sort of more of an organizational level in communities. And to that end, I'm really excited to have Julie Knight. Uh, from Columbus, Indiana, uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about this, uh, about her work there. Um, she's actually based out of Columbus Regional Health, and so I appreciate everybody taking their time uh, today. And uh, Columbus Regional Health is the hospital in Bartholomew County, but Julie is actually uh, a bariatric dietitian uh, who, who, in her day job, counsels patients on weight loss and educates and prepares them for bariatric surgery, monitors the nutrition status of patients, and uh, teaches uh, preoperative education classes. Uh, she graduated from the University of Alabama with a Bachelor of Science in Food and in, in, uh, Nutrition, but uh, she's gonna talk to us about her work in the, the Columbus and Bartholomew County Food Insecurities Coalition. Julie, thanks so much for being here today. All right, thank you, Richard. Um, yes, I kind of have two positions, so I do work as a bariatric dietitian here in Columbus. But an, um, another position with um, the um, Healthy Communities arm of Columbus Regional Health, which is our public health arm. Um, so through that, my role is to support community initiatives um, dealing with health and food um, and nutrition. So um, I kind of don't have a lot of hours a week that I get to spend doing that public health um, area, but um, I one piece of that has been leading the Food Insecurity Coalition. Um, so I'll share my screen. Excuse me. All right. Let's see if I can get my my share here. All right. So um, a Food Insecurity Coalition in Columbus is um, a group of leaders um, throughout Columbus, from our local food pantries to the Purdue Extension, um, other, um, other areas like our Milray Senior Center, our Thrive Alliance, which supports um, senior nutrition um, um, meals, accessibility, um, Gleaners, Salvation Army, United Way and 211, and Cummins. Um, so we've got a, a, a 
fairly good group of people together that meets quarterly to discuss the needs and explore and drive initiatives to improve secu food security in Bartholomew County specifically. And our mission is getting the right food to the right people at the right time. So it, it's a collaboration between um, all these different organizations um, to not just get food and calories to the people of Bartholomew counties, but to, to look at getting healthy food and how can we improve uh, the right food getting to the right people and how can we do that um, getting to them at the right time. So that is our mission. And we spent all of 2019 doing a community food security survey um, where we looked at um, a lot of the things that I really um, enjoyed Dr. Groover's um, talk because I, I feel like we are trying to do the same, same kind of survey and look at our county. Bartholomew County is, a, is, is interesting in that we have, um, we have the city of Columbus, which has a lot of um, uh, support, access, public transportation. You know, it, it's a really kind of thriving city. But as a county, we're a very large county with more rural areas. And so we took a look at Bartholomew County and um, food access and food security. And one of the ways we looked at that was by census tracts, so is kind of see our overview there. We wanted to look at, um, you know, access to food, how are people in these different um, census tracts, what's the poverty rate, how um, is that affecting um, SNAP usage? How are people connecting to benefits? We did some um, um, focus groups uh, with different, different groups around the town. And we did a review of food costs and looked at access to not only to food and groceries um, as far as Dollar General is widely available in a large county, but could you get the USDA food basket? Can you purchase those amount of foods? So looking at that community food security survey, one of the main things we noticed was that the city of Columbus has lots of access to food resources, to our pantries, to large grocery stores. But when you took a slightly larger focus and you looked at the entire county, there were definitely large areas of our county that have little access um, to getting to those to that help to the pantries and to getting uh, connected to SNAP and, and the education there. So the main outcome of that you know, food security survey was looking toward what can we do to improve um, transportation, especially from areas like uh, Edinburgh, Taylorsville area and some of our um, more southern parts of our county. Um, those areas don't have access to the city of Columbus and all that it provides. We also looked at even within the city, um, many people are having difficulty getting to things like pantries and they're having difficulty getting food. Um, utilizing the bus is hard, as, as you saw with Dr. Groover's talk. Um, not only do you have to be physically able to get your food and get it on and off the bus, um, but there's also limits to how much uh, liquids you can carry on city buses. So that was our goal for this year. Um, I believe this year we're going to see a much more um, higher need for all of this as well. Um, that the uh, pantries are seeing much more, um, much more usage. Um, our main employer in Columbus, which is Cummins, did cut everyone's hours by 20% and our factories are shut down. So we have a much greater need for people who've never used pantries to be able to get to those pantries. Um, so that's kind of where we see a shift. Um, some of the projects we have done in the past, um, we do have a double bucks program. This is run by Columbus Regional Health, um, but it's utilizing SNAP benefits at our local farmer's market and doubling them. And so the coalition supports that um, with volunteer hours and help. Um, and the other, one of the other outcomes um, for our coalition has been to develop these food assistance cards. It's a front and back card, as you see there. And this collaboration of having help and, you know, help and funds to um, 
print and distribute these uh, these cards. So we keep them up to date, but it has all kinds of food assistance programs. So um, all in one really kind of handy small card. And it's been nice to um, have that collaborative effort to not only get these created and edited, but also distributed through, through the town. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell. I hope that was kind of uh, enough <laughs> for um, kind of our efforts here. I'll try to try to go try to go back here. No one wants to see that share there. All right. All right. Uh, so. Well, thank you, Julie. That was uh, that was really great. That was uh, and I clap for it uh, as the audience. Uh, that was a really great sort of understanding as a coalition. Will you remind me again that how long has the coalition been in place there? So we are just about at two years in Columbus for this current coalition. Previously, there um, was a, a another food insecurity coalition that disbanded about four years ago. So we really, um, at Columbus Regional Health, uh, Healthy Communities was kind of um, instigator of getting this coalition restarted and reopened. Right, I'm sure. And and have you all increased the amount that you're meeting now with the pandemic? Has that has that shifted you guys into a different gear? Um, not yet. We actually meet next week to kind of determine. Um, we we meet quarterly, so we hadn't met in um, March, and um, we were we had to put off April because a lot of the people in our group were kind of on the front lines of this need, and yeah. um, early April was just no one was ready to uh, even understand where we're going. Um, so uh, we'll kind of talk about that more next week when we meet. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, um, um, thanks again, Julie. That was really great. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Just to, to keep things uh, moving uh, next, uh, it's, you know, sort of building off of your talk, uh, we're going to hear from um, Leslie Brinson, um, who is, uh, has served as the um, she is with the city of um, Bloomington in the Parks and Recs Department and works with the, uh, the um, um, the Bloomington Farmer's Market, uh, which is an amazing farmer's market in, uh, in Bloomington. And she has experience working uh, at community centers there with youth basketball programs and the family resource centers. Uh, she's done a lot in different roles in her, in her career within community. And she has a bachelor's of science from Center College in Danville, Kentucky. Um, and so, and she's, she's done a lot of interesting things and I'm really excited uh, to hear from Leslie about sort of where the Bloomington Farmer's Market is going, which I, I, I've been following. It's, it's open for business, uh, uh, I think this weekend, correct? Correct, yeah, we've been open. Uh, we've been able to manage and run um, since the first week in April, which is when our normal, um, normal market would open. We've had to change how we're doing things, obviously, but um, we are running and I'm just gonna share uh, my screen here with you as well. Um, so that I can give some background information, maybe, there we go. Um, so again, yeah, I'm Leslie Brinson from the City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department. I've been with the department about 18 years, only uh, three years in this current role as community events manager. I supervise the staff that runs the farmer's market. So I, I am by no means an expert in this field and I'm still learning about food security and local food places and and uh, what value uh, it has in our community. I will admit I was a little naive coming into it from, a, from that standpoint. But uh, our farmer's market has been ran by the Parks Department for over 45 years. We operate from April to November every Saturday here at the City Hall Showers Building. We are an Indiana only, growers only market, which makes us a little different than a lot of markets in Indiana where you have to um, grow your food uh, we do have some exterior um, fairs and arts and crafts things, but the market itself is a growers only market. We typically have over 100 farm vendor contracts that we um, approve and, and work with each year, as well as 18 food and beverage artisans that join in, in the process. So anywhere from 60 to 80 vendors uh, uh, any given Saturday with an average of about 200,000 annual attendance. So it's one of the larger markets uh, in Indiana um, has you know ten to twelve thousand people come by it every Saturday depending on the uh, depending on the weather. Um, we are working closely with our health department here in um, 
in Bloomington and Monroe County, we are still one of the counties that are on a stay at home um, order. So, uh, you know, figuring out a way we could run the market in a safe manner for our community was really important. Uh, the city has a grant program through our economic and sustainability department uh, that ended up having a, a local food source grant um, with some staffing and some funding that we were able to kind of tie into for this. And we've been working with the local food marketplace, which is an online um, marketplace for farmers markets. Uh, you pay a membership fee and they're able to set it up. We were able to turn that around in about two weeks. So it was a lot of work to get started. Um, but we did open the platform in um, the last week in March and we're ready to sell in April. We started in April with an everybody orders and pays online, but then you drove through to pick up your order. So we had staff vendors came, dropped off their food, and then we had staff and volunteers go through, pack up people's orders as they drove through. We delivered it and put it in their car. Started with, um, I don't know, three to 500 orders. And by the time the month was over, we were doing 630 orders on a given Saturday. Um, really just became, it was great. It was successful. Um, it allowed vendors to uh, sell. We were, a lot of vendors were selling even more because as you know, when you shop online, it's really easy to click that button and, uh, Think you have more money than you really do so a lot of people tend to purchase more online which works out well for farm vendors um, but we were selling about thirty thousand dollars worth of produce a weekend uh, so really pretty productive um, with about 30 to 40 vendors participating in that in april um, in may we open up to a lot more vendors as you know a lot more produce a lot more customers so we had to change that method so we were able to work with the health department continue with the online order so there is no exchanging of money at the market and no shopping per se but now people actually pay online and then they come and they walk through uh, they go to each vendor's table they get what they have ordered previously during the week um, they're able to see the vendor it puts more responsibility on the vendor um, and makes um, just us a little bit easier to manage the health department has put a stipulation on us to only allow 75 customers in our parking space at a time. So we've divvied up the day into hours and depending on your last name is when you come and pick up your order, that way we can monitor. There's one entrance, one exit. The perimeter is blocked with fencing. So it's a very controlled space. Um, we anticipate operating in this man manner for at least the next two weeks while we're in this stay at home order. After that, we'll continue to work with the health department and see if there's other ways we can continue to open things up. Um, obviously, the online ordering is great, but it has limitations uh, for people who don't have internet or aren't able to come pick up their items or don't feel comfortable getting out in that setting. Um, we do still take and use our SNAP benefits. Uh, we have a double market bucks to triple market bucks program, depending on what system you're in so you can still order online and then you pay with your snap dollars when you come to pick up that way we could still use that process and we are getting you know six to ten people that do that every saturday but i know it's certainly not as much and as useful as it would be if they were able to come and shop by themselves but uh, so that's kind of where we are right now um, the online again system was great but it is again challenging not all farm vendors have access to computers not all farm vendors are uh, technology savvy. Um, so that's kept some from being able to participate. Not all farm vendors feel comfortable being out if they have a are in a high risk population or don't feel comfortable having that interaction. They um, may not want to participate in this format. So we are certainly down vendors. I think this week we have 43 vendors that are participating. Um, normally we would be up in the 60s to 70s by this time of year. Um, the food and beverage artisans are limited in what they can sell. Um, all has to be prepackaged and they're working with the health department for that. So that is, you know, limited. Um, and again, some customers just don't feel comfortable in this setting. We've, you know, had some pushback, but you have to be able to balance what we can do as a staff as well as what, you know, the community wants and what the health department allows. So that's a little bit about what we're doing right now. I anticipate as we move forward, we will continue to look for ways to social distance, to maybe limit crowds, to not have sampling of food, to continue to have hand washing stations and hand sanitizer at every 
booth for our farm vendors and staff to continue to wear gloves and, and masks probably throughout the summer, perhaps. Um, but we'll take that guidance from the health department and then, you know, make adjustments as necessary. But we hope that we are able to open up into a normal, normal setting um, as much as normal is going to be here in the next two to six months or whatever that looks like. Well, that's, that's about that, all. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, giving us and uh, telling us what uh, the uh, um, farmer's market is doing in Bloomington. There I have a clap um, to keep the quietly clap. Um, super interesting uh, present. I, a question just for you, and there's a couple questions in the, in the chat bar as well and some good resources, but you know, as you all created this, um, how, you're, how you're running the market, was there a, somebody else you were looking to? Did you create all of those things out of your own ideas in Bloomington or are there national best practices for farmers markets? Um, you know, I think a little bit of everything. We talked to the health department. We looked at the Indiana farmers market. We had, um, you know, research at what other markets were doing that were similar in size. We looked at Indiana markets, Carmel, and some of the ones in Indy, um, different areas, how they were doing it, what they were doing. And I think we kind of tried to pick what worked for us out of all of those different examples. And then, you know, looking at our space, what we felt like we could do and what resources we do have. We are blessed. We have two full-time staff, one that's solely to the farmer's market. That's her only job. And then another one that's half-time at the market. So we have some resources to spend. I've been spending every Saturday and a lot of time during the week working on this as well. And then we have the grant person. So we, we've been blessed that we have the staffing and the uh, economic ability to do that. I know a lot of markets don't have that. So, you know, we are you know, blessed in that regard, but we've taken a lot of advice from other organizations as well. Yeah, thanks. And just to get to a couple other questions that were in the chat that I think are sort of clarifying is that I just, uh, there was some question is that with your staff, can the, can, um, can the farmers be taught how to use the technology or can, can the vendors be, is that, I mean, it's an interesting thing that technology is at once a solution and a barrier, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, when we first started, we certainly were entering information for vendors. They were calling, we were walking them through, we were creating their profiles and putting their produce up on the site. We've asked farm vendors to buddy up. So if you know of someone who can't, or you don't have that access to reach out, a lot of the vendors, our friends know each other, work together in other settings. You know, we've asked them to help each other out. We certainly don't have the staffing capability to handle everybody's online profile and change that up every week. So we're limited in what we could offer, but we have done that some, and then we're asking farm, vend farm vendors to work with each other to help, um, you know, get over those hurdles. Yeah, and, and, and just to get to Liz Izzo's question is that, you know, she's just bringing up the point is, you know, technology that once it solves a problem, but it's also a barrier. People don't, you know, not everybody has internet, not everybody, you know, exactly. particularly in rural communities, it's a, it's a challenge, but I suppose you're, you're trying something. But she has a question, she says, as a consumer, I ended up bringing home five plastic bags I would not have otherwise wanted or used. Um, so it's, and I know that grocery stores are doing the same thing. You can no longer bring um, uh, your own bags to market. Is there any, I'm sure you guys discussed that. Yeah, when we were packaging ourselves, we were using paper bags, but um, now the health department says that, you know, people can bring their own bag, but the farm vendor has to package it in some way to give it to you. And so some are using paper bags, but some, the only thing they have available if I'm packing, you know, 300, 400 orders would be a plastic bag. So then, and because you're getting it from each vendor who has had to prepackage something, um, you know, you, we are having a lot of that, that waste and it's unfortunate, but it, because of those requirements from the health department and that the farm vendor has to have something prepackaged, they can't just hand you a head of lettuce because then there's that contact. It has to be in something that they can provide to the customer. So uh, it's an unfortunate byproduct of where we are and we've been trying to get rid of plastic bags in the market in general, but uh, for this particular time, I'm not exactly sure how to get around that part of it because the farm vendor has to have it prepackaged when they give it to a customer. Yeah, I wonder how, because I believe the city of New York removed or has a ban on plastic bags. I wonder if yeah. they rescinded that bag and, and what's, um, well, in, anyway, we can get back to the, the conversation, but thanks so much, Leslie, for that. And I'll thank just, you. Uh, thank you, that's great. And just to um, say one other 
quick thing before I move on to Tyler is that Josh wins the uh, the background award for the farm uh, the food systems talks because I don't know if you guys look up closely he has a picture of uh, a head of cabbage behind him a drawing of a head of cabbage so yeah, anyway I'm sorry I got off the topic I just when you mentioned the head of lettuce I looked behind Josh and I saw that uh, <laughs> I was wondering if he could see that actually yeah. that's yeah it's good cabbage up. right yeah it is cabbage yeah Great. My wife uh, painted it. She's a watercolor illustrator. So, great. Well, well, that's a good transition for uh, our next speaker, which is Tyler Goff uh, from Indie Urban Acres, uh, which is a program of the Indianapolis Parks Foundation. Uh, he joined the Parks Foundation in 2011 as a farm manager. Um, so I really appreciate Josh, uh, and this is a, a reminder today that you know this is farming season. This is planting season. So I appreciate everybody being here today, especially Josh. Uh, but uh, India Urban Acres has been solving the hunger crisis, um, and this has been a passion of Tyler's uh, for a long time. Um, and so I, I, um, I'm really looking forward to learning about Tyler and uh, his work. Thanks, Tyler. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to share a screen here um, just to have something up there that's just our homepage about us. I, uh, just real briefly, what I'll do is I'll just talk about India Urban Acres, how we got started, what we do, um, and where we uh, grown too, and then kind of what we've seen and how we're adapting to that just in the last couple months. Uh, but uh, Indy Urban Acres, it's, um, as you said, it's a project of the Indianapolis Parks Foundation. And, and how we got started in 2011 was it was a partnership between the city of Indianapolis, um, IU Health, uh, the city of Indianapolis, as in the parks department. Um, IU Health had the funding, um, Gleaners Food Bank, and the Parks Foundation. So the role of all of those were um, IU Health wanted to, um, it was part of their diabetes, diabetes obesity prevention uh, funding cycle. Um, so they donated money to the Parks Foundation to start a farm to give all the produce away. So we donate 100% of our produce, goes to food pantries. Uh, that's where the Gleaners Partnership came in. Uh, the Parks Foundation, uh, this is where it gets a little confusing. Basically, that's the 501c3, the fundraising arm of the parks department. Um, so we technically, that first site is a city park. It's on um, municipal land. There is no public money going into it, uh, but it is it is city land um, that we farm on. Um, first year, first couple years, we were growing 30-some uh, thousand pounds of produce, going directly to food pantries, to uh, help battle that food insecurity problem. Um, since then, we now have four, we have five farm sites actually. Um, they're all around the city. Part of the way that we're able to um, donate money is through earned income. So one of those farm sites is actually a flower farm. Um, so we grow flowers and we um, sell flowers at various outlets, but uh, mostly through grocery stores around the city, uh, Kroger stores. Um, we have about 1,500 volunteers uh, at all the farm sites. We employ about 50 high school kids, inner city kids, to uh, help us farm, but really to learn to become farmers. We have um, at least 1,000 uh, younger, littler kids that come through the farm for, for free tours. So it's a lot, uh, a lot going on besides uh, growing food, but one of the things that we, we kind of had a shift, um, I guess it was a couple years ago, and, and um, the food pantries are, are, are overloaded and, and, and they're very important. Um, and the reason we were giving um, produce to food pantries, high quality produce, um, is because most food pantries don't see that. The produce that they do get is um, uh, basically on, on its way out, uh, a lot of times spoiled or rotten. So getting them that high quality produce is important. But what we saw as a farm, um, we grow all this food and we take it to the food pantry and we never interact with our customers, uh, one bit. So our customers are the, the people that go to the food pantries. Um, and I'm very careful to, to call them customers and not clients because uh, we wanna make sure that, that we are, are getting what they want and, and what they need um, through, through our produce. Uh, but so if you're going to the food pantry, it's, you know, it's a variety of issues. You, um, you lost your job, you got sick, your car broke down, you have health problems, whatever it is. Uh, but a lot of times um, 
that can can put a real toll on people in our community. Um, so we like to uh, the one food pantry that we're really tied to is just two blocks away. We like to, as a farm staff, walk it there. Uh, so these these uh, people are in line uh, for a long time. In some cases, they can see for one how uh, close the the food comes from that we can actually physically walk it to the food pantry. Um, they can see the people that are there for them. We have no reason to exist as a farm. Um, just we're there for them. And I, I don't have any uh, proof of any of this, but I, I would like to think that that can um, maybe up morale uh, for the people that are at the food pantry that uh, they can see the people that care for them and, and care about the situation that they're in. Um, so with that, um, we feel like that was important but also just to talk to our customers on what they want, what they need, um, other ways that we as a farm uh, can help out with the situation. So we started a program um, called the Veggie Box. Um, so what this is, uh, it was piloted in a low income Section 8 community on the far east side of Indianapolis. Um, we started with 50 families, it's an application um, and basically it's a CSA share, if you know what that is. It's, uh, it's a share of the farm for, we go about 20, 20 weeks during the year, um, the family uh, gets a share of the farm. So a veggie box, a box of produce designed to last them a week. Um, we have three sizes, a small, medium, and a large based on family size. Um, we're partnered with IU School of Medicine to do uh, health assessments, a pre and post survey, so we can see uh, people if they're getting healthier. We do bi-weekly satisfaction surveys. So we want to know um, what did they like, what what did they not like. Uh, we have recipes that go in there um, every week with with uh, the veggie boxes based on what we're serving that week. Um, so it's that first year was uh, great. It, it worked out really well. Um, I will say I will say this we the idea was to start with 50 we got about 65 applications in um, and seeing the applications there was no way that I could say no to anyone so we did 65 that first year um, last year we did uh, I think about 100 110 shares um, and so we were already looking at ways this year uh, to ramp that up even more because we knew the need was going to be there and at, I, I'll, I'll actually say um, not because we knew the need was going to be there because we didn't know the need was going to be there like it is, uh, but we see this program working. Uh, we see it working very well. Um, we see people getting healthier. We see people eating more vegetables. Um, we see people, uh, we look at it as a job creator almost. People are getting healthy and then able to get back to work. There's so many different uh, benefits of just knowing you can rely on fresh produce uh, and good fresh produce. Um, so we, we think as uh, Indy Urban Acres is a farm, uh, non-for-profit farm that's gonna give us food away. We think that this is probably the way, the way that we're gonna go in the future. Uh, still supporting food pantries because it's important, but uh, really uh, focusing in on the veggie boxes. Um, then March happened. So mid-March, um, uh, everything changed for for everybody. Um, the food pantry, like I said, that we're closely aligned with is one of the largest ones in Indianapolis. It's two blocks away. We kind of feel like um, we're we're in lockstep with them. We we work with them. We um, you know in the off time we volunteer there. Um, Mid March and, and as you know, food pantries are run on a volunteer basis, and a lot of the volunteers are older folk, um, and they were on the verge of shutting down because of, of volunteers, uh, because um, they couldn't work. They, they shouldn't be working in that environment. Uh, so we as a farm staff took over the serving shifts. So three days a week, um, me and I, I've got nine uh, farm staff, we went over and we passed out the food. Now, this food, food pantry serves, um, on average, about 300 people a week, and uh, between March and April, it went up to 1,500 people a week. Um, so that's the need. You, uh, so we, as uh, the group passing out the food, what we saw 
um, was a lot of people that had never been to a food pantry that, that were coming up and wondered how it worked. Um, we saw a lot of people worried. And uh, I think the scariest of it all was we saw a lot of desperation of people that were really uh, desperate for food and had no idea um, how they were gonna get it and when they were gonna get it again. Uh, so that was scary. Um, so the veggie boxes, uh, right away, we knew that that number was gonna go way up. And um, we're just starting to get applications in. And we estimated um, probably about 150, and I probably have 300 to 400 applications right now. Uh, so we're actively working at ways that, that we can do 250, 500 boxes um, even this year. So we're, we're actively ramping up uh, what we do and, and how much we grow and uh, our capacity just to serve that need. Uh, going into the future, um, you know, we'd like to think that things will get back to normal and people get, will get back to work. Um, but there's already a sense, it, you know, in the food pantry and, um, you know, for a lot of, of older people that uh, rely on the food pantry, they're not, they were never getting back to work and the systems aren't in play uh, for them to ever not need a food pantry or ever not need food stamps. Um, when we're see, uh, you know, we're in an environment, a political environment where, uh, you know, budgets come out and there's always gonna be a proposal to cut food stamps, uh, which, is, which is disappointing to me. Um, but I think going into the future, what we need is a system to get people uh, food that they need um, in the best way possible. And, and right now I just don't see, uh, I don't see that getting, I don't think we have the political climate or the political will uh, to make that happen. That's why this, um, the veggie boxes and the, and the food pantries are extremely important right now. So that's, that's, my, that's my take on what's going on and um, hopefully it's been uh, informative to you guys. If you have any questions about what we do and um, all of that, you can reach out to me through the Indianapolis Parks Foundation, indyparksfoundation.org. Um, hopefully in July, you can come out and visit the farm too. Well, again, th thank you. I think everybody uh, is really impressed with um, what you do and and i know i was really excited that you were willing to come here and so thanks for I, I feel guilty just having you here because of the work that's ahead of you uh to fulfill these orders so thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us but and there was a number of questions in the chat and it just but it, if if i could you know maybe just ask you one and then ask one for the group but it's sort of the same thing but um is there a way that i mean is it too late in this season to scale up no, so we are, we're doing it. Um, we're, we're making decisions just this week on, um, we now have five farm sites. One site is kind of expandable. Um, so we're, we're cutting into more ground, it seems like every single week. Um, we're limited on staff. We can only, only produce, uh, because, because of our volunteer situation. Um, I don't see us being able to have volunteers for month at least um, so we're limited right now on the staff we have um, we're actively looking for funding that we um, we're pretty confident on that will allow us to bring on an additional six staff um, but it's it's uh, we're we know that those numbers are, are going to keep going up on the need on veggie boxes um, and and every week we're kind of making decisions on how much more we can do and, and finding creative ways that we can grow more food and, and get more people that that needed food yeah well, just before i maybe open this up more publicly just to ask the the five panelists again thank you uh, to me that was so impressive you know we started with Shelly in this sort of international scale talking about Goya and the US Embassy of, of McDonald's down to, you know, all the way to, to Tyler delivering food in person to a food pantry. And I think we see the entire scale of the food system. So thank you all for such a, an interesting perspective on that. Um, but you know, so I guess just the question is that to you all is that seeing that scale in the system, you know, what are the things that you see um, in the system where that, that could fix some of these problems? 
I guess is my question. We see, we see the food insecurities, we see what you're doing. How do we scale what seem like great solutions that you've all come up with and, and how, is it possible to scale that? I, I mean, I guess um, for us in, and I'll just go back to the veggie boxes. Um, it's raising money as a nonprofit, raising money so that we can do these CS, CSA shares uh, for free for people that need it. Um, it's a matter of fundraising. Um, it's a nonprofit farm. Um, it, it's tough to sustain, but it also uh, might be one of the most sustainable models that as long as our, our city thinks it's important that we're growing this food and giving it to people that will be around. Um, but it's also what I see is uh, staff is, is finding farmers, finding people that want to do the work and that are passionate about the work. Um, so with those, those high school kids uh, that come to the farm, um, they start the first day and they don't want to be there. They don't, it's hot, it's dirty. Uh, by the time it's all over, they're, they're farmers and they're excited about um, growing food for their community. So um, ways to scale it up would be to, to teach kids um, how to grow food and the importance of growing food, um, continued funding so that we can keep um, high quality produce to families in need is extremely important. And um, the land is there, we can find land um, for us and our operation in the veggie box and produce to food pantries, um, a pipeline of, of kids that can farm, people that want to farm and, and get paid for it, funding, land, we got sunshine and water and we got food. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, guess, yeah. I, I guess I would add on uh, to what Tyler was saying. Um, by talking about staff and employees too. I mean, that is, uh, you know, he mentioned that and, and, and from farmers around here, that's what I hear is a really challenging uh, thing to, uh, to continue to hold on to our uh, reliable uh, workers who actually want to do the work. The work is hard and I'm sure uh, Tyler can speak to that. Um, uh, you know, the weather can be unforgiving um, and um, so being able to have a consistent, reliable uh, workforce is, is one of the challenges. We're hoping to, uh, to partner with um, Purdue Extension and maybe the Boys and Girls Club um, here in East Central Indiana in doing some youth farmer training programs um, in the next year or two. And it's that same idea, you know, basically bringing people in, showing young people how to do this and potentially, hopefully sending them on their way and, and growing more farmers that can actually produce more food that we can eat. Shelly, I wonder if you have any thoughts about scale or scalability and in, in within the system that you see. Uh, yeah, I guess um, kind of my always, my first comment or scalability is um, to avoid co perhaps cookie cutter concepts, um, you know, for what works in one region may not work in another. So, you know, if that, you know, neighborhood or community has kind of reached the scale that um, it's at or that it foresees for itself, I don't see anything wrong with that. You know, if it's sustainable, it's serving its community, not every time do I think that there's a need for scaling up in all cases. Um, you know, I, I think the main issue I see kind of especially that I saw working for the city of Indianapolis, people are looking for a silver bullet solution in food system issues. Um, there's a variety of different complex problems. Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that we need to have that silver bullet. I think it will look like a variety of different things in a variety of different communities. Um, so if, you know, I always tell people, whether it's size, whether it's timeline, um, if your project did what your mission said it was going to do, um, I don't see anything wrong with that. If it was only in your neighborhood and only lasted for five years, if you your mission was to reach out to young people, um, activate the youth in your community around um, community food project, I think that's wonderful and that's fine that it was um, micro in geography and micro in time. I don't know necessarily do we always need to think about um, scaling up absolutely everything, you know, to have very efficient 
um, economically appropriate activities. That's a really generous way to look at it. That's, I mean, that, you know, just to, to, for folks even just are doing a little bit that it's good, right? And don't get stressed out about that. Maybe just to, to go back to, to Leslie and, and Julie, is that within you see in your food systems, do you see any kinds of farmers out there like what Tyler's doing that's maybe that's using a more nonprofit model within the food system? And, you know, it's, it's interesting to think of, there was a couple other examples I was looking at for this talk where there are nonprofit farms, which is in a sense what Josh and Tyler are, are doing in that way, is that, you know, is that a model that, that moves the needle? I, I'm not aware in our area um, of a nonprofit farm. So I found that as a very interesting, um, you know, a, a very interesting program and in how it works um, because I could see that working, you know, in the Columbus area. Um, so that's, that's kind of my take here. Yeah, I would agree. I don't know of any in Bloomington or Monroe County. I don't think I I don't know that there are any, but doesn't mean there aren't. I just am not aware of them. But I would agree with also what Tyler, I think, said about um, new farmers. You know, we are certainly seeing a lot of our farmers kind of age out of the, the ability to come and spend all day at a market or be able to load and unload and really utilize what we're doing. So, you know, that the importance of not only finding young people, but also a diverse diversifying the the farmers that are out there as well um you know could be benefit i don't know how you do that um but i could see that definitely being a challenge as well as the old school farmers start to to age out of the ability to do the hard work yeah and um there's a user now just mentioning the the victory gardens uh which happened in world war ii which is a little bit of the inspiration for this talk is just and, and maybe I'd move this to open it up to, to general questions if somebody wants to turn their mic on and ask a question, but it was, you know, is this idea, how can we take a nonprofit model, these different models, but also is there, are there things that we can do on our own homes that help the food system or help us down the roads? And so I, I think uh, the user for putting up the notion of victory gardens, but I think Liz Izzo was having some interesting uh, thoughts about, um, you know, sort of workers and wage, which I think is an interesting concept because all of a sudden now we have, uh, you know, unemployment off the charts, you know, so then you have a, you know, is, is this a shift in the market for farming? I don't know. Is that naive on my part to think about? I, one of the things that I, I've consolidated the eight gardens that I, I manage for our schools here in Georgia down to three and made them victory gardens. And um, Michelle, will you just um, say hello and say maybe oh, where you're from? Yeah. Hey, hi. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, technically Marietta, which is north of that. I'm a friend of Miss Joyce Moore. I serve on her um, a program with her with the American Community Gardening Association. Um, but I personally run. Um, I'm a master gardener sponsor for eight of our public schools and I run composting education and food production and farm to school, um, counseling of kids are, so a lot of different things. Anyway, when the COVID happened, I consolidated all of our compost, all of our tools, all of our equipment to three gardens, made them victory gardens, grew some things that would produce fast and got some approval to be able to distribute it to families, but ran into a lot of challenges, whether it was food waste, um, because the lettuce would wilt in a day and a half. Um, had to get a lot of plastic bags and had to let those sit for 72 hours or spray them with Lysol and then the Lysol touching the food. So there's so much that I found as far as obstacles, but then the school system, I'll just share a victory. The school system said, if you are there in your truck next to the buses that are distributing the food in a hold harmless way, let them know, please wash it before you eat it and have that conversation as a third party and not the school system, they allowed for the food distribution to happen. So. That's great. And if you have a link to your program, we'd love to see it and share it. Sure thing, it's a uh, community sprouts. Um, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, 
And then is there a way on this group to share each other's cards? You know, that's a really good thought. Um, we'll work on that as a, a sort of a, so we're gearing up and just to say we're about, to, I want to be careful to end at three, but we're gearing up um, to sort of summarize this with uh, Rick Valicenti and some other folks. And we'll, we'll do that tomorrow. But I think one of the things that came out of this is, is each group, you know, there is a little bit of a network that's forming in a way to connect. And so um, I, I, we'll figure out how to do that. Yes. But certainly you could put your uh, link right over there. When you say there, in the chat? In the, ch in the chat. Yeah, thanks. What, um, was there somebody else that maybe had one more question or a thought to share? We can continue the discussion after three o'clock, but I just, I would want it to officially end at three o'clock. Oh, there it is in the, in the link. Thanks, Courtney. Rick's clapping, that's a good thing. That was, um, well, I, I think we'll just, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up then. I, if if uh, Indie Design Week and Poppy is there, I just wanna, wanna thank you all for uh, A, participating and attending this. Uh, really glad to have so many people um, this week thinking about these complex issues. Um, food system is certainly one I think about. Um, you know, Shelly, I live close to one of the old double eights. And, um, and so I think about that and I, and I uh, you know, we have to drive to get food from my house. And so there's, there aren't very many uh, um, good, still not, not a good answer to the closing of all those double eight food stores in Indianapolis. But, you know, thanks to all of the presenters for taking so much time out of your busy schedule at an incredibly busy time. Thanks for everyone uh, for uh, hanging in. Uh, and um, I will, if, if Poppy's there or maybe Danny will close us out on behalf of Indie Design Week. Yeah, thanks Richard. Thank you guys so much for attending, uh, especially those who lasted all four days. Um, I'm the creative director of Indie Design Week. Poppy had to step out um, for just a moment. Um, but really, truly thank all of you guys for, for being here. And we've got more events coming um, today. If you go to IndieDesignWeek.com, you can find what those look like and links to get there, but all kinds of different things that are, that are happening. So, yeah. Well, thanks, Danny. And I'll be sending a follow-up email to the attendees that will push, uh, push out a, a, a link for tomorrow's YouTube Live, which will sum up the day. And all of these will be recorded and put back into the web page, and we'll find a way to connect uh, everyone together. So thanks very much. Uh, and you know, we're going to stop the recording and let folks that have to go head out. Uh, but we'll hang out and chat for a while. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate the invitation. It was great. To Thanks, Shelly. Yeah, it was great. Bye-bye. Likewise. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Great job. Love to come visit you up in Muncie. Yeah, absolutely. Always yeah, welcome. I want to see Tyler in his farm as well. Yeah, me too. I want to see that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a couple field trips coming up. Yep. <laughs> and, and we'll go down and see Michelle as well. Yeah. <laughs> I was say on a fun note, so um, Joyce hosted our conference for our American Community Garden Association, and I made sure to tour all of your local breweries. Oh, oh. 